Hey everybody, this is Patrick GMT and I'm partnering with Chegg. And here we're going to talk about directional derivatives and the gradient vector. So we'll see how to find the value of a derivative in any direction. And we'll talk about what's known as the gradient vector and how to maximize that gradient vector. Okay, so let's recall uh, something very analogous. Okay, suppose I've got my surface, my function z equals f of xy. And I'm sitting at some point on that surface, a point with coordinates a, b, and c. Recall that if we take the partial of f with respect to x and plug in those values a and b, what we're doing is we're finding a, a tangent line, a slope of a tangent line, and the slope of that tangent line, if you imagine projecting that line into the, the uh, xy plane, that tangent line is going to be pointing in the same direction as the x-axis. Likewise, if we take the partial of f with respect to y and plug in that point, a comma b. What we're doing now is, again, we're finding the slope of another tangent line, and if I were to project this, that tangent line into the xy plane, that tangent line would be pointing in the same direction as the, the y-axis. Now, if you think about it though, right, I mean, if you're sitting at this, at this point, I mean, why do you have to go in the direction of the x-axis or the direction of the y-axis? Maybe I want to go some other direction, right? Maybe there's, we've got 360 degrees. There's lots of ways we could head, you know? It's like you're standing, standing at the, the, uh, on the side of a mountain. Which way do you want to go? Well, this directional derivative helps generalize that idea. So suppose we're sitting at some point again on our surface that's got coordinates x sub 0, y sub 0, and z sub 0. And we want to find the slope of a tangent line. And if we pr project that tangent line into the xy plane, suppose it's going in the direction of some unit vector with components a, b. Well, it turns out to find that, that uh, the slope of that tangent line, which we call the, again, the directional derivative, and we use this notation. What we do is we take the partial of f with respect to x, multiply it by a, and we take the partial of f with respect to y, multiply it by b, add those values together, and that's what's going to be known as the directional derivative. Notice we could write this using a dot product. And if we write that as a dot product, we would have a vector with components corresponding, corresponding to the partial of f with respect, respect to x, the partial of f with respect to y, dotted with that unit vector that had components a and b. This first vector that contains those partials, that's what's known as the gradient vector. So when we talk about the gradient vector, that's what we're talking about. Just a vector that contains those partial derivatives. And just recall, we can rewrite this vector in the following form. The partial of f with respect to x multiplied by i, the unit vector i, plus the partial of f uh, with respect to y multiplied by that unit vector j. Okay. So... A, a, a result we can use, it says if the unit vector u makes an angle of theta with the positive x-axis, then our, to get our directional derivative, we take the partial of f with respect to x, multiplied by cosine theta, plus the partial of f with respect to y, multiplied by sine theta. And that makes sense, right? Because if, if this is my angle theta, the components are going to be cosine of theta and sine of theta. That would give us a unit vector. So let's find the directional derivative of this function y times cosine of xy at the point 0, 1 and the direction theta equals pi over 4. So I've gone went ahead and jotted down the formula for us, and now it's just a matter of computing, computing partial derivatives. Okay, so I'm looking at my function here. Again, I'm treating x like my variable, y like a constant. So the y will come along. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Let's leave the inside alone. If I take the derivative of x times y, again, treating x like a variable, I would multiply, in this case, by y. We'll leave cosine of pi over 4 alone. And then to add to that, we would have to take the partial with respect to y. Well, in this case, I've got, you know, a couple y's floating around. I'm going to have to use the product rule. So the derivative of uh, 1y is just going to be 1. So we'll, I'm, I guess we'll write it down. Um, so we've got 1, uh, we'll leave the cosine of xy alone, plus now I'll take the uh, derivative of the cosine xy portion. So I'll have to leave the y alone. Okay, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. We'll leave the inside alone. 
And if I take the derivative of x times y, again, treating now y like my variable, I'm going to end up with an x. And again, that's multiplied by sine of pi over 4. So let me double check my derivative there. I think everything looks good. I always still have to slow down when I'm doing partials just to make sure I don't do something crazy. Okay, so now all we're doing is we're plugging 0 in for x and 1 in for y, and we'll see what happens. So notice for sine of xy, if I plug in the x-coordinate of 0, I'm going to get sine of 0. And sine of 0 is 0, right? This part's going to be 0. And since all that stuff is being multiplied together, this whole first uh, term is going to be equal to 0. So we can do the same thing with the next part, kind of make that observation. We would have cosine of 0 times 1 or cosine of 0. Plus, again, I'm going to get this sine of 0, which is 0. So we would have plus 0 multiplied by sine of pi over 4. Well, sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. So I would have 1 plus 0, which is 1, multiplied by root 2 over 2, which is simply going to be the square root of 2 over 2. Okay, I think that looks, looks good to me. All right, let's look at another one. So let's find the directional derivative of f, the function f of x, y, where that's equal to x divided by x squared plus y squared at the point 1, 2 in the direction of this vector that has components 3 and 5. One thing I'm going to do is rewrite my function, too. So I'm going to rewrite my function as x multiplied by x squared plus y squared raised to the negative first. And I'm just going to do that because it's going to help me think about things when I do the partial with respect to y. Okay, the only thing that's really different in this problem is that we're not given a unit vector, right? Uh, if we have a vector with components 3 and 5, that's not going to be a unit vector. Well, to get the unit vector, we just take our vector v, divide it by its magnitude. So our vector v has components 3 and 5. Recall to find the magnitude, we take the square root of the sum of the components squared. So I have the square root of 3 squared plus 5 squared. So that's going to give me uh, a unit vector where the first component is 3 divided by, well, this looks like 9 plus 25, or 34. So it's going to be 3 over the square root of 34, and likewise, 5 over the square root of 34. Okay, so now we have to do the same thing. We've got to take this, all these partials. Okay, so the first part, we take the partial, again, of our function with respect to x. So there's x's in the numerator and the denominator, so we're going to have to use the quotient rule. So we'll take the bottom, multiplied by the derivative of the top, minus the top, multiplied by the derivative of the bottom. Again, y is being treated like a constant. x is my variable, so I would be left with 2x plus 0, or just 2x. And then we take the denominator and square it. And again, this is going to get multiplied by that first component of our unit vector, which is 3 over the square root of 34. Plus, and now we'll have to do the same thing. We'll just take the partial with respect to y. So now I'm looking at it at a, 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 up here. So x is a constant. It's just coming along. We'll have to use the chain rule. So the negative 1 comes out front. We leave the inside alone. Let's take 1 away from our exponent. If we take the derivative of the inside, x squared plus y squared, again, treating y like a variable, x like a constant, we'll only be left with 2y. And that has to be multiplied by 5 over the square root of 34. So I can't imagine too many of you want to watch this part, so I'm going to spare you from it. So if you want to evaluate this directional derivative at 1, 2, again, you're just plugging in everywhere you see an x. You're going to plug in 1 and do a whole bunch of fun arithmetic. And then everywhere you see a y, you're going to plug in 2 and do a whole bunch of fun arithmetic and simplify it down. So equals some number. So again, just like derivatives in first semester calculus, you're calculating a slope of a tangent line, you get a number. That's what's happening in these two. You're getting the slope of a tangent line in a certain direction. Okay, let's look at a couple more examples. Okay, so suppose we have the function f of xy equals y times the natural logarithm of x. So in part a, we'll find the gradient. Well, the gradient is simply defined to be, again, the partial of f with respect to x, the partial of y with respect to x. So this function, fortunately, isn't too bad. 
if I take uh, the derivative of ln of x, that's going to be 1 over x. So I would have y multiplied by 1 over x or y over x. And then if I take the derivative with respect to y, well, the derivative of 1y is just 1. We're treating ln of x like a constant. So that would be my gradient vector. Uh, part B, if we want to evaluate that gradient vector at the point 1 comma negative 3, again, you're just substituting in 1 for x and uh, negative 3 for y. So we would get negative 3 over 1 comma the natural logarithm of 1. So that's going to be negative 3, and we know that the natural logarithm of 1 is just 0. And last but not least, uh, we're given, we want it in this direction of this unit vector with these components. Well, in this case, all we have to do for part C is we take our gradient that we evaluated. So that's got components negative 3, comma, 0. And we dot that with the that unit vector that has components negative 4 fifths, comma, 3 fifths. So recall we multiply respective components and add those together. So if I multiply negative 3 times negative 4 fifths, that's going to give me positive 12 fifths. And then we add... So I would take the component uh, 0, multiply it by 3 fifths. Well, that's just 0. So it looks like we're going to get 12 fifths in this case. All right, let's talk about maximizing the directional derivative. So the idea is if you're on a surface at a point, and you, it, what you're doing is you're trying to figure out which direction does f change the fastest, and what is that maximum rate of change. That's what we're trying to come up with. Okay, so it turns out that if f is a differentiable function of two or three variables, the maximum value of that directional derivative is the magnitude of that gradient vector. And it occurs when our unit vector has the same direction as the gradient vector. Okay, so that looks maybe a little complicated, but it turns out they're not too bad to do. So let's find the maximum rate of change of this function sine of xy at 1, 0 and the direction in which it occurs. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is just compute our gradient. Okay, so in this case, we'll take the partial with respect to x. So the derivative of sine is cosine. We'll leave the inside alone. But then we have to take the derivative of the inside. And if we treat x like a variable, y like a constant, we'll multiply by y. And if we do the same thing, um, if we take the partial with respect to y, we'll be left with cosine of xy. But then if I'm treating y like a variable, and x like a constant, I'm going to end up multiplying by x. So maybe I'll just rewrite this one more time. So we have y times cosine of xy, and x times cosine of xy. Okay, so we're told the direction that we're going. So, or excuse me, we've we, we got the point, I take that back. So we've got to evaluate our gradient at that point. We don't have the direction yet, but we've got the point that we're sitting at on our surface. So, well, we've got the x and y coordinates of the point that tells us where we would be sitting on the surface. We could compute the z value, but we don't need it. Okay, so if we compute our gradient at this point, 1 comma 0, again, I'll simply plug in 1 for x, 0 for y. Well, because of this y right here, the first component's just going to be 0. It looks like I've got 1 here for x. I'm going to get cosine of 0, which is also simply equal to 1. So it looks like my component is going to, uh, second component is going to be 1. So this gradient vector evaluated at 1, 0 has components 0 and 1. So to get the maximum, so to get the maximum, um, we simply take the magnitude of that vector we just found. So that's not too hard to compute. 0 squared plus 1 squared. We take the square root of that, which is just going to give us with 1. And it's in the direction of that vector we found. So the maximum change is equal to 1. And it's in the direction of the unit vector with components 0 and 1. So, OK, quite a few things going on here. Um, you know, I would say probably. The hardest, most tricky part of these is, one, just remembering all these formulas. Um, you know, that's always a tricky thing in mathematics, keeping these at your fingertips. But then I think probably just doing these partials to me is, is the most tedious part of it, and doing the arithmetic.
Um, other than that, hopefully it's somewhat straightforward. Again, do make sure that when you do these, um, that your vector is a unit vector. You know, if I was just using the number three here and the number five here, if I didn't find that unit vector first, that would be incorrect. I would get the, the wrong value. So do be careful about that as well. And yeah, otherwise I hope this is a useful little introduction and points you in the right direction.